Okay, so let's <coughs> let's continue. Uh, first of all, a well, small announcement uh, because unfortunately our last speaker, Alexi, uh, she cannot uh, make for some reason here and, and, and even online talk. So it will be the last talk has been canceled and we, we will move tea and coffee break um, after the Merrick talk. Uh, with this, so I'm happy to please to uh, present Dr. Emma Bond from British Antarctic Survey, and she will talk about ocean circulation and dynamics. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I'm from the British Antarctic Survey, and as we don't know, we're just a bit further west from here. We've brought some nice Antarctic weather here. I didn't realize you're not mic'd up. I'm not mic'd up. No. Um, yeah, sorry, let me just put this down. It'll be easier to start. Mm -hmm. Okay, how's that? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, for those of you who couldn't hear, <laughs> British Antarctic Survey, over the Arctic wasteland or Antarctic wasteland that way, um, past math, past the Schlumberger building, almost at the M11, but not quite. And we're tucked away there and we have been for several decades now. So if you don't know the British Antarctic Survey, we're the, we're the UK's Polar Institute. So we're made up of roughly 50-50 uh, operations and scientists. So our operations um, are in charge of running our bases on Antarctica. So we represent the UK in the Antarctic, in Antarctic region. We have two bases, um, Rothera and Halley, that are our biggest ones, and numerous other small research stations that are manned out, um, seasonally on islands surrounding Antarctica. We also have our research vessel, the RRS, Sir David Attenborough, which you may have heard of, or you may have heard of what it was almost called, which was Boaty McBoatface. There is actually a Boaty McBoatface on the, the SDA, as we call it, the Sir David Attenborough, which is an auto sub, a yellow submarine. So if you go online and have a look at it, you can follow the adventures of Boaty, an auto sub that we send underneath the ice to take measurements and bring back. Um, so as I say, about half of bass is um, operations and the other half is scientists like myself. So we're um, employed by the Natural Environment Research Council and we're from a range of disciplines, oceanographers like myself, but we also have ecosystems, biologists, atmospheric scientists, a lot of cryospheric scientists, quite obviously, but we all share a, a focus on the polar regions. Um, so my background, I did my PhD just much closer here at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Applied Math and Theoretical Physics over a decade ago now. Um, and my speciality is uh, dynamics of the Southern Ocean. And since then I've been at Bass where I've been mostly working as an ocean modeler. Um, so today I'm going to give you, I know this is a very specialist meeting, so um, but I'm going to give you a kind of more general overview of um, the kind of, you know, ocean circulation dynamics 101, but hopefully get into some more of the interesting nitty gritty kind of open questions and stuff near the end. Um, please do stop me and ask me questions if you have any, especially if I slip into jargon, as you probably all know, each discipline has its own jargon and it's hard to remember which words are which um, when you're not when you're not um, when you're immersed in a field you can sometimes forget which words are unfamiliar to other people even a very in a very related field like fluid dynamics okay so without further ado um, a bit of background why why we should care about the ocean on a you know big large-scale open oceanography um, then most of it will be talking about the fundamentals of circulation dynamics on a kind of global ocean scale and then finally the maybe the more interesting bit what what, what are the open questions in oceanography at the moment um so why why should we care about the ocean um it's very important for the climate in fact it takes up over 90 percent of the extra heat and 25 percent so a quarter of the carbon dioxide that humans i should say humans have added to the climate system so basically it's doing us a really big favor if if all that heat and CO2 wasn't being absorbed by the ocean, it would have nowhere else to stay except in the atmosphere. So the atmosphere, which is what we feel, the atmospheric temperature of the world would be that much higher. And so would the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, it's important for us as human beings. Over 3 billion people depend on the ocean for their livelihoods. And about 600 million people 
which is about 10%, I think, of the world's population, or slightly less now, live less than 10 meters above sea level. And, you know, from a scientific point of view or a mathematical point of view, you've got lots of interesting physics and math going on. You've got interactions across scales. You've got the large scale forcing of the wind and the sun. Um, but there's important physical interactions going on at all scales that are, um, and I, I'll show you later on that even very relatively small scale interactions can have implications for the large scale uh, circulation. And you have interactions with the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the lithosphere, although that's less studied in open, um, on a large scale at the moment in my field anyway. Um, so there's lots of areas of interest basically. Um, so let's start from the beginning. Where does the energy that goes into the ocean come from? Well, ultimately all of it comes from the sun. Um, and this is just a very basic diagram of the heat going into the, into the earth as a, as a function of latitude. Um, so the red line is what, we, what we, comes in from the sun. And then the blue line is what's uh, radiated back from the earth. And you see, you can see where, where you have a surplus here at the, in the, near the equator, you have warming of the earth. Um, and over the near closer to the poles, you have a deficit of radiation where the earth is um, cooling. And so we have to move this energy. This isn't a stable situation. You have to move this energy from uh, the equator to the poles and the ocean being um, a large part of the Earth's surface do that. Um, and so if we look, what does the ocean look like in a kind of similar um, crosswise? Oh, wait, that's not yet. <laughs> Here you can see the impact on. So this is uh, a, what's called a spillhouse projection. We, we quite like it at Basque because it puts Antarctica in the middle, which you can't quite see here because it's quite black. So the black is also showing the sea ice. And then this is sea surface temperature um, going through the seasons. So you can very much see the solar forcing going in here. So the very, um, the light warm colors near around <coughs> the equator moving around seasonally and then um, the colder colors closer to the poles. So that's the forcing going in at the surface, but of course the ocean is 3D. We don't and, um, just look at the surface of the ocean. And this is the, this is the density structure we end up with when we kind of take a very, very simplistic view when we take a cross section through the ocean again. So this is north south, but it doesn't really matter here. The, the schematic is quite um, symmetric. So we have the warm or light water sitting on the top. Uh, so the ocean has uh, density is de dependent on obviously temperature and salinity. In most parts of the ocean, temperature dominates and some parts like the, oh, sorry, the Arctic salinity can play an important role. But for large parts of it, it's mostly temperature dominated. So we end up with this kind of warm um, layer sitting near the surface, what we, uh, we call the mixed layer, which is uh, mostly in equilibrium. Its properties are in equilibrium with the atmosphere. So, and we call it the mixed layer because it's well mixed and the properties tend to be fairly homogeneous within this layer. So this is where the quick interactions take place between the atmosphere and the ocean. It, the fluxes, um, between the ocean and atmosphere will adjust quite quickly to try and keep these in equilibrium with each other. And then below that, we have what's called the thermocline. So this is where um, this basically, mean, this means damp temperature gradient. So this is where the temperature gradient is relatively steep and this, uh, and it goes, it gets colder relatively quickly. And this, this kind of gradient in temperature separates off this mixed layer from the deep layer of the ocean, which still, slowly ha that does have a temperature gradient, but it's a lot less steep. And this deep water down here um, is very quiescent. And this water down here often hasn't seen um, the surface for hundreds or even thousands of years. Um, so there's not much going on down here. And then we have a kind of barrier, the thermocline, the gradient in temperature. Um, and then we have the mixed layer up here where everything's going on. But obviously we, uh, as I said before, we've got this, we've got circulation going on as well, trying moving warm water from the equator into the poles. So what does that look like? So here I unhelpfully flipped the axes. Uh, so the South Pole is now here and the North Pole is now here. And what we were looking at before was these, um, de uh, de the density structure. So the density structure here is shown by these blue lines. Um, and what's uh, overlaid on here is the various processes going on. So we've got, again, buoyancy gain, so buoyancy being 
uh, heat, basically, but buoyancy also has contributions from um, fresh water, so evaporation or precipitation. But generally, it's on a large scale, again, determined by temperature. So we've got buoyancy gain around the equator and tropics and buoyancy loss at the poles. And that water is moved around by what we call the overturning circulation because it overturns. Um, so we generally, this is a very, this is mostly, this is from, from the Atlantic, but it's fairly um, well representative of the Pacific as well. We have warm water here, this uh, travels north, it loses a lot of heat here. Um, so it gets denser, um, sinks down into the interior of the ocean. And again, at, in Antarctica, we have similarly, um, we have, it's a bit more complicated in the Southern Ocean. There's lots of interesting processes going on. But similarly, we have buoyancy loss due to cooling. We also have a lot of uh, uh, dense water formed when sea ice forms. So when ice forms, it rejects brine um, because it can't hold anywhere near as much salt as seawater can. So what's produced when you I, uh, sea ice uh, freezes, sorry, when water, sea, water freezes and creates sea ice is very cold, dense water, very called brine, um, that basically falls as a density current over the, um, top, over the continental shelf and spills down into the interior of the ocean. So you've got this very cold water mass, bottom water, we call it, being formed here. And also interestingly in the Southern Ocean, we don't have any topographic barriers. So we think of the other oceans are all basins because they're topographically limited uh, east and west. Whereas the Southern Ocean is actually a band that encirculates Antarctica. So the wind here can build up, um, doesn't have anywhere for a pressure gradient to be held really. So it um, creates this lifting of these density surfaces and you have a very strong uh, ocean current here. Um, and we also have divergence of the wind forcing here, sorry, changes in wind forcing here produce the divergence at this point, which pulls up this water along these isopycnals, isopycnals being density surfaces. So we have um, divergence of fluxes here, pushing cold water, some water towards Antarctica to the shelf where it mixes with this deep water and sinks down and some water heading north towards the back towards the tropics where it gets submerged slightly. Um, and then this pulls up this water along these density surfaces from the, the interior. So there's lots of um, different processes going on. Um, and as you can see, this kind of depends on this, this whole, uh, the strength of this overturning is all dependent on a lot of different processes happening in a lot of different places. Um, so that's horizontal, that's, sorry, that's vertical, what we call the overturning. And what about horizontally? Um, well, this is quite, goes back to kind of simple um, physics. If we think about the wind, where, sorry, where the prevalent winds are um, over the earth, we have easterlies over the equator and the westerly storm tracks in the north and south hemisphere. Um, and so these provide, uh, these produce currents going the same direction, not surprisingly. But then we also have the Coriolis effect. So things tend to turn to the left in the Southern hemisphere or to the right in the Northern hemisphere. And so that ends up joining up into what these, these big ocean gyres. Uh, and then a kind of second order effect on that is the fact that the Coriolis effect varies with latitude. So there is no Coriolis effect at the equator, it's zero. And it gets stronger and stronger as the closer you get to the poles you're spinning relatively faster and faster. Um, or sorry, the, 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 the effect is stronger and stronger. Um, so what we see is that these uh, Eastern currents that are heading towards the equator um, are feeling the Coriolis effect less and less. And so these become quite broad and slow. Whereas these Western currents, what we call Western boundary currents, um, are sharpened and by, this, by the Coriolis, by this gradient in the Coriolis parameter, um, what we call the beta effect. So we get sharpening of these um, currents as they go towards stronger and stronger Coriolis effects. So these Western boundary currents are quite sharp and narrow and fast compared to the Eastern boundary currents. So the famous currents you've heard of, like the Gulf Stream is, our Western boundary currents. So we also have the Kuroshiro um, coming off of Japan. 
which you might have heard of. And then there's uh, across Africa, we have the um, Agulis current that comes out and retroflects and makes the nice Agulis rings that you might have seen. Um, so, and then when we join that all together, so we've got our vertical overturning and our horizontal gyres, um, that all kind of works together to create the kind of overall, what we call the uh, overturning circulation. And again, I've used the spillhouse projection, which puts Antarctica in the middle, because it really does join all the different basins together. Um, this is just to get you, show you the feeling of the fact that we have things going on at depth and at the surface, going in different directions. We've got dense water forming in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, and then heading back out into the other basins and coming in and going out and moving around. Um, so there's all, all sorts of important things going on at different scales. Um, and yeah, I quite, somebody called this the kind of the fish's view of the ocean, which I quite like, or the fish's view of the world. It's like um, where all the important bits in the middle and all the unimportant bits at the side, but it's quite a nice one. Okay. Um, so the other bit I mentioned was in the kind of interactions across scales. So this is a kind of very crude diagram of the energy cascade in the ocean. So at a large scale, we've got input from surface buoyancy fluxes and winds, which are, I mean, really driven by temperature gradients, but we'd normally treat them as a separate energy input. So we have momentum input from the winds um, and thermal input from the sun. Um, we, there is some geothermal heating, although we don't tend to uh, consider that too much in my work. Um, and so then what I've been talking about so far is how the this surface buoyancy fluxes and the winds impact on the large scale ocean circulation. Um, and we also have this downscale energy cascade, as you might effect, expect, where the energy is dissipated th through smaller and smaller scales, and eventually you get down to turbulence irreversible mixing is um, the energy is lost to irreversible mixing or to boundary friction friction we also have the influence of ties in here which is not something that we put in global circulation models at, at the moment but it's something that maybe is quite important and i'll talk, come back to that later but we also have um, this upscale influence so what this represents is the um, when we have um, the production of mesoscale eddies via baroclinic instability. So when we have, um, as we see here, let's see, where we've got these density surfaces are not aligned with pressure surfaces. So you've got, um, as you go deeper and deeper, you've got this kind of available potential energy here. You've got density surfaces stacking up on each other. And you can see that really the, the minimum potential energy state would be for that to be flat. And so that, what, that's how, well, that's what happens with um, when we have that's what produces baroclinic instability, um, which forms eddies, turbulent eddies. Um, and so what we actually find though is that these turbulent eddies, these baroclinic instabilities, you know, um, reintroduce energy upscale. So they send energy back into the mean flow, what we call eddy mean flow interactions. It also happens in the atmosphere, um, where eddies can the energy from eddies can sharpen the um, westward jets. The weather jets but and it, it happens in the ocean as well so we've got um not only are the uh eddies a way of dissipating energy but they also introduce they're also um very important to understand the mean flow and to represent the mean flow correctly um so i'll just show this video from nasa very quickly it's got some cheesy music but so this is all from this is from a si simulation um, this is what I call oceanographer porridge sometimes. It's got loads of um, really nice eddies in it. This is surface velocity, so the kind of the as you can, it's very kind of visually easy to follow. Everything that's thicker and whiter is going faster, basically. And I put this on here, so here you can see the Gulf Stream, just to show that that really simplistic view of the ocean might be how things move on a large scale over long time scales, but really the ocean is a big kind of eddying, turbulent thing with all these interactions across scales. Here you can see the Agulis current. Sorry, Rick. Yes, they'll be forced. This is an ocean model that's forced by solar radiation, by wind, by um, evaporation, precipitation, all sorts of inputs. Anyway, I really like it. But this is just to show that that simplistic view that we have of like just, you know, one big arrow taking water somewhere 
It's not really what the real ocean looks like. Um, no, so they're, they're due to the instabilities. So the, um, here we go, here's the, oh no, this is Kurashima. So they're due to baroclinic instability, that fact that we've got kind of warm, uh, warm waters um, kind of sloping upwards um, and where you, the wind can produce instabilities as well. That tends to be on a smaller scale. Um, it's more the kind of density structure that becomes unstable, the large scale density structure. Um, so these are what we call mesoscale eddies, so tens of kilometers across. Okay, so that's 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 why I'm putting them in here. Yeah. Uh, what do you think your initial data in a model like that? Like if you start everything from lead, what exactly kicks it off? Is it wind? Um, so you would just you have to spin up these models for a long time to get them to equilibrium. So if you're trying to do something that's realistic, so representing current day, you spin it up for maybe 500 years with a repeated forcing. Um, so you'd start with something that just is the same forcing every year. And you'd run that for a five, maybe 500 years. And then when it's getting, when everything's stabilizing and not drifting anymore, then you'd start to say, okay, well now I'll do the 1950 forcing and then the 1951 and then the 1952 and so on and bring it to the current climate. Forcing. So you the forcing, um, so if, you're, if you've got an ocean model, the ocean is dynamic. The initial conditions will, are going to be something that you've taken from a spun up model. So the spun oh, okay. up model. So there's, there's some initial velocity here. Yeah. So it has initial conditions. You'd have to generate those by spinning up your model for, like I say, for hundreds of years first. Once you've got that spun up model, then you might put in realistic winds, solar radiation, evaporation, precipitation. Um, and it depends how complicated your model is. If you're putting in a, a, um, a suit, uh, an ice model, then you'd need initial conditions for your ice sheets and um, some models have static ice um, and some models have interactive ice where the ice actually evolves so it depends how complicated your model is but yes so that would be included in the fresh water fluxes so you'd have um, so what's called runoff so you'd include some observational runoff which is, would be a source of fresh water that you put in a grid cell, you know, where you, you, know, you get your package of runoff forcings from you know, somebody else and they'd say, this is realistic runoff. And you'd say, okay, and plug it in and it would produce some fresh water at given grid cells at different times. Any other questions? So yeah, these eddies here in the Southern Ocean are especially important. So they're trying to release this potential energy and some of these ice signals back down and they're working against the wind that holds them up. So the balance between the eddies and the wind is actually what sets the, the, the slope of these uh, ice signals here and determines the strengths of the, the Antarctic circumpolar current that goes around here. And, um, and subsequently also determines the strength of the overturning that we see here. Um, so these eddies are generally are not resolved at all in the global climate models that go into, for example, the IPCC. Um, so if you have an atmosphere and an ocean and all the other fancy things that go into global sort of climate models these days, you do not resolve these well enough. You need quite, a, because the Rosary radius of deformation gets smaller as you get to the poles, eddies get smaller as you get to the poles. So you need even higher resolution the closer you get to the poles to, to resolve these. So they're parameterized in global circulation models. And even in um, uh, global ocean models, they're, what we, they're mostly what we say um, permitting rather than resolving. So you can have eddies forming, but you won't be fully resolving them. So the kind of high resolution ocean models at the moment are one twelfth of the degree. Um, and they do pretty pretty well, but it's still there's further you know further gains to be made from resolving them further. And of course, the more you include, the less you have to parameterize, which makes it uh, the, a better representation. So often, often eddies are parameterized as just extra mixing, basically, and it can be really basic and can just be one number for the whole ocean, or you can get a bit more complicated and have different schemes that depend on um, the density structure, but it's never a replacement for having the real eddies in there. Um, so how are we doing for time? Right, open questions. 
So the, one of them is this missing mixing, which is fundamental to the closure of ocean circulation. So back in, everything's on this picture. I love this picture. Back in 1966, Walter Monk, very famous grandfather of oceanography, um, released a very famous paper called Abyssal Recipes, in which he tried to like close this circulation. And you can see on here that you need some sort of background missing mixing across um, across density surface, what we call diapycnal mixing. So as fluid likes to travel along isopycnals or density, constant density surfaces, but you need some sort of mixing to get fluid across density surfaces. So that's just to, to balance everything, you need some mixing. And he put in the numbers from observed velocities around, um, observed current velocities around the globe and came out with an, an order of magnitude estimate for what the background mixing of the interior ocean should be, the diapycnal mixing. So dutifully, the observational oceanographers took their measurement instruments out and went and looked for this background um, mixing. And what we, they actually found was that almost everywhere they could measure is two orders of magnitude too small. So that's what led to this idea of the missing mixing. Like, where is this mixing occurring? The more and more measurements of currents and other things we met made just um, didn't overturn this very simple idea of water monks that really there's some we need some way of getting water across uh, isopycnals and if where where is it happening basically um, so a lot of advances have come around in the last decade of, from some uh, very um, deliberate field campaigns that have gone to look for mixing and the the, the current thought is that a lot of it is occurring very close to the bottom. It used to be thought that mixing would drop off as you got closer to the bottom and things got boring. But actually, it turns out well, there, there are mixing hotspots where topography is rough. But even that wasn't quite enough to make up this two order of magnitude difference. Um, and the current thinking is that it might be breaking of tidal waves or breaking of inertial waves over topography that can actually, these events can produce much larger mixing than has been previously been thought. Um, but that's still kind of an open question. Um, if you go and do a field campaign in one place for a couple of weeks and observe really large mixing values, it's still quite a lot of work to then say, okay, if we've solved the missing mixing because there's enough similar places and similar events around the world, you know, there's a bit more work to be done to prove that these kind of individual events are really happening ubiquitous, ubiquitously around the ocean and in enough, um, um, yeah, enough frequency and enough magnitude to, to close the missing mixing. So that's one of the open questions. And in modeling, really, the, it's, the challenges are including these small scale effects. So we have these eddies, we have these isofutant interactions which happen up on the shelf that are not resolved in any of the GCMs, um, so the global climate models. They all, instead, instead of doing this, where they have uh, um, deep water formation on the shelf and this nice deep water cascading off, off the topographic shelf, sorry, the continental shelf, to close, to close this limb, they end up having uh, open ocean convection happening throughout the Southern Ocean to just basically get that water down, which is completely unphysical. And we don't, don't see open ocean and convection um, in the Southern Ocean ever. So the, that's completely wrong. Most of the models that do have ice sheets don't have interactive ice. Um, there's ties that need to be included, internal waves. As we've seen from this, this mix, missing mixing problem, actually maybe these, the breaking of tides and internal waves could have a really important um, role to play in closing the overall global circulation of water. And then submissive scale processes, are, that's a really growing field, looking at how much mixing this produces um, and um, how much energy is lost in these sub-scale processes. And yes, I could go on. But so these are the kind of open challenges in modeling. Um, so I'll leave that there. And I think it's kind of like the law at the British Antarctic Survey. So you have to have a picture of a cute penguin to finish. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, questions? Sometimes you show the camera the 3D version of the picture of the eye. Yeah. And, um, oh, yeah. Do you understand why? Oh, sorry. 
uh, deep water around Antarctica turns in one sense and uh, hot water uh, in the other sense? Ah, uh, yes. So we've got, this is the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is largely wind driven and the, the speed is determined by those um, sloping isopycnals that I showed you before. So, and then what we have is the deep water formation largely here in the, this is the Weddell gyre and the Ross, the Weddell Sea and the Ross Sea, where the deep water forms and then cascades off. And then the reason that it turns the other, yeah, the reason that it turns the other way on here, um, I'd have to go and talk to my colleagues to remind myself. I normally talk, look at the bit slightly further out rather than this bit. Um, Really but you say the, the, the top one is uh, yeah, yeah. no yeah and I should know the answer to that <laughs> and I can't think of it off the top of my head but um yeah I think that, no you're right because the um oh no they're going the way they are going the same way oh yeah sorry <laughs> I was thinking why would they be going the opposite way okay they're not. <laughs> all questions for you uh, can you comment on the time scales for these uh, processes for the circulation in the vertical direction and also in the uh, horizontal? Yeah, so this overall, as I said, it can be hundreds or thousands of years even that things stay here um, down in, in the deep ocean, basically. Um, these, it depends, these processes will take, you know, to get travel through the Gulf Stream, for example, will take weeks. Um, so it's very variable, basically, like most of the ocean is doing nothing, but then there's very, very vigorous um, energetics happening um, close to the surface um, in these currents um, and where you have these instabilities near the near the bottom. Um, it depends. The question is, I guess the question is the time scales depend on the spatial scale as well, right? If you're looking at large spatial scales, it's just, the time scales are longer and if you're looking at small spatial scales the time scales are inevitably shorter i guess it depends on exactly what the question is you're trying to answer what the time scale might be sergey in your numerical code what is the mesh size several kilometers just to to, to understand um, so so the highest resolution ones are about a twelfth of a kilometer. Sorry, a twelfth of the degree, which is how much is that? Nine kilometers of the Yeah, nine. Yeah, so nine down to maybe five or six at the poles. And that's a high resolution one. I mean, the ones I work with a lot are even still one degree, which is quite big, bigger. <laughs> um, so yeah, it can, it's quite coarse, really, if you're looking at the global. But then you can get very high resolution sector models. People do more high resolution you know, models of individual bits of it. The Max Planck Institute in Germany has just released a simulation of the blue marble um, at a, I think it's 1.25 kilometers in the ocean, but they can't run it for very long because that resolution requires a lot of people. They've done it to show in principle it can be done, but really ideally you'd like to run all your models. Yeah, I mean, to get- resolution. To get the to get things resolved, what we really want is dif is differential um, resolution depending on how close you are to the bottom. The problem we have a lot is the cells in interacting, impinging horizontally on topography, and then you miss that really messes up all these important interactions. So there's people at Southampton who are do working on adaptive meshes that are kind of no, more of a kind of normal grid in the middle of the ocean. And then as you get to topography, they kind of switch to more density following coordinates to get around that. But that's, those are not, there's not many of those that are kind of operational really. Yeah. So was, what do we need to do to destabilize the structure of current? Do we need to do a lot or a little? Destabilize the structure of currents. Yeah. It depends which current you're talking about. Um, Oh, the global pattern. Well, yeah, I mean, there is there are global changes happening. So they, um, we think that the um, this, which we call the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or the AMOC, which is basically a fancy way of talking about the strength of the Gulf Stream, 
Um, we think that that is going to continue. There's a bit of debate about that. People are worried about these doomsday scenarios where it just shuts off if you dump enough fresh water in the Arctic Ocean, basically. So the Arctic Ocean is, is a source of fresh water already. And it, it, as more and more of the Arctic sea ice melts and more of the surrounding um, you know, permafrost and everything melts, all the rivers go into the Arctic Ocean. There's worry, there used to be some worry that this kind of doomsday scenario might happen where you dump so much fresher water and it would basically shut off this limb of the Arctic, the returning. But we don't think that's going to happen anymore. Um, it seems quite unlikely, it seems very less likely there may be still possible. Uh, I think I'll, on that. Um, I'll just shout. Um, the uh, IPCC report, the latest report, says that the slowdown in circulation in the Atlantic is likely, uh, the collapse is unlikely. So yeah. if you've ever watched The Day After Tomorrow, that sort of thing is never going to happen. Uh, but the circulation can slow down. And in fact, we've got measurements from the Atlantic which show it's slowed and then it's flattened out. Um, it's slowed down and stopped slowing down. But whether it'll continue to do slow down or come back up, we don't know. We haven't got observations long enough to tell. Uh, we have an online question. Uh, there remains some ambiguity about the establishment of bottom pressure torques and their specific role in balancing the vorticity balance of wind-driven gyres. Any thoughts? Um, I'm not aware I'm sure of that debate, I have to say. So the idea is that um, within each open gyre, you have to have a balance of energy. So the wind can't keep spinning, you know, the wind can't keep spinning up the gyre. Um, and, and the energy is lost at the, at the bottom where you have a balance in bottom pressure because you can set up pressure gradients across the gyres. Um, I'm not aware of that debate, I have to say, because that's not, my focus is normally on Antarctica. So that's my understanding, but obviously there is some debate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can I ask? Yep. Uh, so as part of the, the, this program and, and also last week's workshop, we, we saw uh, some experiments, lab experiments on uh, internal wave uh, generation. Um, and you, at the tantalizingly at the end of your talk, you mentioned possible explanations of this missing mixing and you included internal waves in that. So um, is, is, your, is, it, is it plausible that that is, like why is that considered a plausible explanation and does it involve the kind of uh, co large scale coherent structures uh, that one gets because um, wave breaking can give rise to uh, solitons uh, yeah. that, that propagate certainly near the coastlines and so on. And so do those play any role in perhaps ex helping to explain this missing mixing? So I'm not an, an expert in internal waves at all. I put it up here because I know that that's something that people have been looking at to try and explain this mixing. As far as I'm aware, the current thinking is that um, there probably isn't Internal wave breaking probably does generate mixing against topography under the ocean, but it probably doesn't explain enough of the missing mixing to be the answer. But I think there are there are definitely important, as for my colleagues, what I have understood is there are definitely important processes that are not well, well understood or well represented, especially how things change as you get close to topography. Thank you very much. And we could continue during the discussion.